Hey, good morning, Rocky Mount. Uh, there is, uh, I guess, no way to spin this. It's been a, uh, a horrible week, and, uh, but it's, it is part of life, and I just want you to know how uh, strong Tony was. Uh, he, the man went 13 days without food and water, and he, uh, his blood pressure, even on the day that he passed, was 80 over 50. So he might have been a puny little joker, but he was strong. And uh, the, the best part about it is that his faith in who God was in his life was even stronger. And uh, we got to watch a man over these last uh, few months face death right in the eyes. Uh, he did not want this to be about him. He didn't want you guys to know that it was a death sentence. Um, <coughs> And he knew very early on, staff knew, uh, but he didn't want it to make it be about anything but that. Uh, we haven't, and I'm reverbing here. Um, he, uh, you know, he had a 3% chance with chemo and radiation. That's how bad it was. So, and he still faced it every single day with grace and strength and character courage but most importantly faith in Jesus Christ and uh, so just wanted to, to let you know how he passed he passed as a man of God and I watched his wife who was pretty much Job <laughs> for what all she's gone through um, watched her go through that and, and to see her strength and faith and she would not stop worshiping I uh, want to let you know this is very tentative um, Carrie's just got so much on her plate state-wise and trying to get things in order uh, the girls and Stephen uh, been very sick we're talking 104 temperature um, so Carrie just said I've got I've got to heal um, she's been by his side every minute for the last two months and she just needs some time to uh, to digest and to rest and to mourn herself so what she is asked to do is right now tentatively uh, tentatively Please don't lock this in. We are going to have a worship service for Tony on Friday, March the 20th at 2 o'clock. And we'll get into ways that you can help with that here in a little while. But first, I would like for us to uh, just go to prayer, go to God in prayer as a church. God, um, you bless this church in so many ways. We ask, Lord, that um, you bless the Putnam family right now. Let them know how much you love them and, and care for them. More importantly, let them know about the promise that you have made for us through the covenant of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on that cross. God, I lift up Carrie to you now. I thank you for the servant that she is, and more importantly, the saint that she has been to sacrifice and love, to be dedicated in life and in death to the man that you gave her. And for those kids, God, I can't imagine watching my daddy die at 52. So uh, just, God, uh, let them feel loved by us, but more importantly by you. And um, I thank you for their father's witness to them. So, Lord, we ask that the mourning begin, but at the same time, the healing. And we're going to give you praise through all of it. It's in Christ's name. Amen. Just have a, uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, the, the first one is, is this. Um, March 1st is going to be our very, uh, our, our first one of the year, our new members class. So if you have been visiting Rocky Mount for a while, or you have questions, or, or, what, or you just hadn't pulled the trigger and joined, our new members class is at 11 o'clock, and it starts next Sunday. And if you would like to sign up for that, go online, go on our website, and sign up for it. Uh, it's, it's a well-done program. It, I promise you, you'll have everything that you could ever question. It's going to be right there for you to, to understand, and uh, it's, it's a really good class. So that starts next week. Go online and do it. Also, this Wednesday, if you have never been to an Ash Wednesday service, George Ann and I have talked about it. it is the, for us, it is our favorite service of the year. I mean, it really is. It's, uh, for Christmas, Easter, 
Ash Wednesday to me is the most meaningful um, because you're preparing yourself for uh, the, the Christ King, but Christ going to the cross and understanding the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. So uh, that is going to be this Wednesday here in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. And I urge you to come. All right, folks, if you're a guest with us today, thank you for coming. We hope and pray that you feel welcome, feel loved, but especially don't feel too churchy because that's not what we want to be about. So it is about a relationship and not a religion with, uh, with uh, Christ. So we're going to love on each other right quick. Remember, it's flu season, so let's bump some or just pap somebody on the head, all right?
Let us pray. Dear Jesus, your goodness and your mercy is always chasing after us. We thank you for never giving up on us and for never turning your back on us. Please help us to be like a cup of your goodness and grace and mercy so that when life bumps us, that it's your goodness that will spill out and not anger and negativity. And help us to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, Please be seated. As we prepare for our offering this morning, I want to ask, ask you all what is your offering? What is your offering? Offering is, is not just about money, finances. It's about what God has blessed you with. You know, one of the things Pastor Tony always talked about coming from another church was that how healthy Rocky Mount was in its uh, in its giving and uh, and its wisdom in terms of how money's been used and transparency and uh, it talked about you know there's not that many healthy churches like this place and I'm thankful for that but it doesn't come just from money it comes from your heart and it comes from what you can and, and will do for the kingdom and and uh, offering is what we do with our, our mind our body our spirit a lot of folks have asked, and I am so thankful for this, I've had so many phone calls asking this question, what can we do? So, well, I want to give you some things that you can do. Uh, March 20th, when we do have our services, uh, we need ushers. We, uh, we are going to need, we have had to, uh, we, we're expecting 12 to 1,400 people here for that service. So this room will seat 700 we can put another 200 downstairs. We can put another uh, 300 in the fellowship hall, all for a live feed. But that's the same day as the women's conference. So we are going to have to be very versatile and need a lot of volunteers for setup and, and take down. And uh, so we need help with that. Uh, we've called St. Paul's and they're going to give us their, their uh, parking for that day. We're going to have shuttle drivers because we just don't have the parking for it. So you want to drive shuttle if you want to be in the parking lot if you want to be an usher if you want to help do the bulletins you know when you're doing 1200 bulletins it's it's a lot to do uh, if you would like to cook and, and help that with the meal you can do that there are so many things but I also had other folks ask about financial stuff uh, you're welcome to do that all you've got to do is put it in uh, uh, pastor tony's family and in your memo for the church and and we'll get that taken care of and and to help that family as, as a missions project. Um, you know, but there's a lot of stuff that just comes about and people are thinking out of the box in terms of helping the family. Uh, somebody called me this week and said, uh, when Stephen has to go back to Florida, I wanna pay for his plane ticket. You know, we don't think about that kind of stuff, but those are the things that are um, happening with this family. Um, this week we were blessed. I called Kevin Cook, who we've dealt with for all these years and uh, they have offered to do, um, they are doing everything for Tony's services uh, under cost. Um, so, so that's a great thing. So, you know, everybody has something to offer. But I think first and foremost, it comes from what we offer from our heart. If our ushers would come forward at this time. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful and all my so, so good. 
with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close and like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Good morning, church. Oh, man, the worship is so good this morning. So good. It's good to be with y'all uh, here today. And I'm glad that you are here with us and we're all together. Um, so in the fall of 1989, I was uh, working on my third year of college. And I walked into my very first physics class, uh, very first one. You see, I had recently changed my major for the third time in three years and I was gonna need this class because I was gonna be a doctor and uh, you got to have that apparently um, and so I walked in and full of hope and I sat on the front row and I opened up my book and I got my pen out and I was ready to take my notes and in walks the professor and he starts saying all these things about isms and theorems and starts writing all these numbers and letters on the board and drawing all these lines and 
an hour went by or more, it felt like more, and um, I just uh, sat there, and when the class was over and everybody got ready to leave, I looked down at my piece of paper. I had managed to put my name and the professor's name, and that was it. So I took uh, about 262 steps from that physics class into my advisor's office and I dropped physics and I changed my major for the fourth time in three years and yes I had awesome awesome parents that never gave up on me <clears throat> here's the thing I don't understand I mean I did not understand and there was no sitting in that class to help me understand here's the thing this is my whole deal with physics Here's a pen, and it is up here. Now it is on the ground. That is called gravity. Case closed. So for all of you folks who want to tell me all about it after, no, don't even bother. Don't bother. And those of you who know me, you won't bother because you're like, girl, I ain't going to get that. There are just some things I don't understand. Here's another thing. I don't understand bees. I don't. They have big fat bodies and little bitty wings and they still fly. I don't get that. I just don't. I don't understand hot dogs. I don't understand why there are 12 hot dogs in a package and eight buns. I still don't get that. That is a food conspiracy. I know. I know. And here's the other thing. Last but not least, I don't understand diets because this is the way they work. A man and a woman can start a diet on the same day. A woman can eat half the calories the man does. The man will lose twice the weight. I'm thinking that that theorem was in physics class and I just missed it. But I don't understand how that works. There are a lot of things I don't understand. But this morning, what I want us to ask ourselves is, is, is what about your faith do you not understand? I mean, is there, are there things about your faith that you just don't understand? If you're honest, if you're honest, are there just some things you go, yeah, I just, mm, I don't get that. I don't understand that. I'm here to tell you that it is okay and that God is okay if you don't understand. That's the first and foremost. See, I've seen people over the years uh, in ministry, and they'll say things like, I believe in Jesus and everything. I believe he's the son of God. I got all that. But could he really be the only way to God? I mean, that sounds a little elitist, and it sounds a little excluding. I don't really like that verbiage. I mean, what about people who've never heard of Jesus? What happens to them? I mean, I don't understand that, right? Or, or what about the Bible? What about the Bible? People, people say that about the Bible. They'll say, I get the Bible. I understand it. it's God's holy word, but didn't a bunch of men write it? I mean, didn't they like translate it over the, the centuries? And, and what if they made a mistake? What if there's something in there that's not quite right? I mean, can I really trust it? There's a lot of questions that people just don't understand. And, and I'm right there with you. So, so I've asked those same questions throughout my life. I've really, what really gets me though is when things in this world just seem to get crazy. Like, I don't understand. And, and I question, where is God? You know, we're in this sermon series, can you see him? Can you see him in the middle of earthquakes and natural disasters and floods and the coronavirus and, and sex trafficking and kids killing kids and, and violence beyond violence? I mean, can you really see? see God does it ever leave you wondering where are you God where, where are you can, can you see him because honestly sometimes I don't I don't I, I don't see him I, I, I have a hard time seeing him can you see him when there are so many things that just don't make sense and you don't understand. That's what we're talking about this morning. Would you pray with me? Father God, I pray that the meditations of my heart and the words of my mouth would be nothing but glorifying to you and you alone. And God, we just ask that hearts be moved and changed in this moment. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we're going to look at basically the entire chapter 9. We're just going to zoom right through it real quick. Um, and Andy Stanley, a pastor down at North Point in, uh, in, in Georgia, he says this about this particular scripture in John chapter 9, verses 1 through pretty much 35, 36. He says, you don't have to understand everything to believe in something. 
Say that with me. You don't have to understand everything to believe in something. There are things that are unexplainable, and then there are things that are undeniable. Amen? Yeah. John 1 says this. John 9, 1 says this. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind since birth. Okay. This guy had been blind since birth. Since birth. He, he had never seen a sunset. He had never seen a sunrise. He never saw his mom or dad's face. And because he was blind since birth, he was uneducated. He did not have a job. And he was basically a beggar on the side of the street. And this is where Jesus ran into him. Verse 2, Rabbi, the disciples ask him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sins or the sins of his parents? You see, back in that time, during that time in first century, uh, people thought that if you had a physical disability, that somehow it was because of sin. It was your fault. or It was either your fault or the fault of your parents. Obviously, somebody did something. Somebody committed a sin, you committed a sin that caused this issue, that caused for him this blindness. And see, even today, we think that. Even today, there are people who think that God is punishing them for something they did wrong. I've, I've heard people say, oh, your kids are on drugs? Mm, you must have been a really bad parent. Must be your fault. It must be your fault. You must have done something wrong. You didn't spank enough. You spanked too much. You did too much time out. You didn't do enough time out. I don't know, but it's all your fault somehow. And so that is, we still do that today, and this was just the way things were back then. This is the way people believed. This is what they thought happened. You must have done something wrong. You must have sinned, and this is the result. And to add insult to injury, here is this guy who was born blind, and, and the popular opinion is, oh, you did something wrong. It's all your fault. It's all your fault. And so uh, then Jesus says something stunning. Verse 3, he says, It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. This happened because the, so that the power of God could be seen in him. Can you see him? Can you see him? Because in God's economy, in God's culture, what we often call setbacks are just God setting us up. What you and I often think is a setback in our life is just God setting us up for him to be glorified. You see this all throughout scripture. If you go back into the Old Testament, there's many stories. The first one that comes to mind for me is Joseph, the story of Joseph. Here's Joseph, and he has this dream from God that he is going to have all these people bowing down to him. The very next day, he's sold into slavery by his brothers. And, and in, while he's in slavery, he gets accused falsely of something and he gets put in prison and so he's in prison now at this point of the story lots of setbacks right yeah lots of setbacks but what it is is God setting Joseph up because he ended up being the second in command in is in Egypt he was the second highest man in Egypt and those brothers that sold him into slavery oh they bowed down to him in mercy and for mercy, before it was all said and done. Jesus Christ, teacher, savior of the world, crucified. Crucified, setback, right? <laughs> setback, savior of the world, crucified, dead on the cross. Mm, that was God setting it up, right? Setting it up, because three days later, he rose from the dead. It wasn't a setback. It was a setup for God to be glorified, for him to be glorified. The Bible says this, that we only see through a glass dimly. We only see through life with a fog. We don't see everything clearly. We don't see everything anyway. We only see a part. The Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we don't have to understand everything to believe in something. I'll give you an example. When I was a little girl, I wanted to be a teacher. 
I did. I, maybe we all go through that. We all want to teach. So I taught my baby dolls, and I taught my stuffed animals, and I had this, this hamster, my first hamster. Um, his name was Snuggles. And so one day I decided I was going to teach Snuggles, uh, believe it or not, some math. I know. It was already, already a trouble. Um, no calculus, no physics, just some two plus two. So I get out my little chalkboard and I put it in front of Snuggles' cage and I write two plus two equals four. And Snuggles is sitting there in his bowl and he's just eating away and nothing happens. Nothing. So I'm like, hmm. So I say it a little louder because maybe he can't hear. Hey, Snuggles, two plus two equals four. Nothing happens. So then I go and I get in my mom's candy jar and I get out four pieces of candy and I lay two pieces down and I say, Snuggles, if you have two pieces of candy and two more pieces of candy, how many pieces of candy, Snuggles? I get nothing. I get him in the wheel. He's just in the wheel going around and around and around and around and nothing happens. So... Then, you know, I could look at this and I could say, um, well, I must have taught that wrong. Well, maybe I did. But but the bottom line is that Snuggles is a what? Uh, He's a hamster and he ain't going to understand, right? He's not going to understand two plus two equals four. He's never going to get it. He's not going to understand because he's a hamster. And hamsters are incapable of understanding two plus two equals four. But it doesn't mean that two plus two equals four doesn't equal four, right? Just because Snuggles doesn't understand? Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Here's the other thing. On the grand scheme of things, if it's you and me and Snuggles and God, me and me and you and Snuggles and God, you and I are a whole lot closer to the way Snuggles understands the big picture than God, okay? Just in case y'all are thinking otherwise. You're a whole lot, you and I are a whole lot closer to that snuggles in of things. Verse 6 says this, and this is just gross, okay? And then he spit on the ground, made mud with his saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. Got one word for you, lawsuit today. Would be a lawsuit. <laughs> he told him, Jesus told the man, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing Now, we could stop right there. I mean, what a miracle. This guy had never seen, had never been able to see, had been blind since birth, and all of a sudden, God heals him with this miraculous healing, and he is changed forever. The guy is so excited, he doesn't even thank Jesus for his healing. He doesn't even see Jesus. He just heads out and starts for his neighborhood and goes going back to show his parents, you know, oh my gosh, I can see. So his neighbors, verse 8, and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked, each other. Isn't that the guy who used to sit and beg? And some said he was, and others said, no, I just think he looks like the guy who used to sit and beg. But the beggar kept saying, I'm the one, I'm the one. And they asked, so who healed you and what happened? And his neighbors were like, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. We don't understand this. I mean, how can this be? I, I, I don't understand. And the poor blind guy's going, I can see. I, I can see. And the neighbors are like, yeah, but how did that happen? And, and, and what, how did you do that? I, we don't understand that. Verse 13 says, then they took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees because it was the Sabbath that Jesus had made the mud and healed him. Now, if this was an episode of Law and Order, this is where you'd hear that. Dun, dun. Right? Dun, dun. Yeah, got Law and Order fans in here? Yeah, man. So, yeah, this is because in that moment, everything changed. See, what happened was you can't do anything on the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. And even spitting in the ground and making some mud and putting it on somebody's eyes and telling them to go get in a pool is apparently work. And so Jesus had broken the law, and he was a sinner. Dun, dun. Right? Verse 15, the Pharisees asked the man all about it. And so he told them, okay, he put mud on my eyes, and then I went in the pool and washed it away, and I could see. And this poor guy is probably like up to here with his neighbors. I mean, I'm just reading his story. I'm up to here with his neighbors, right? I mean, they are just asking all these questions. They are missing the huge point here. They're missing the point that there are things I don't understand, and there are things that you don't understand, but there are things that are undeniable 
undeniable. John 9, 16 says, some of the Pharisees said, this man Jesus, he's not from God. You know why? He's working on Sunday. He's working on the Sabbath. He can't be from God. And others said, but how could this ordinary sinner named Jesus, how in the world could he do such miraculous signs? So there was a division among them. And they couldn't understand it. And, and therefore, they couldn't believe it. And they couldn't explain it. So they didn't believe it. And, and they, they, they wanted God to be in a box. I mean, that's what was really going on here. They couldn't explain God. They couldn't make sense of it. They wanted God to be in a box. And and dare you let God out of his box? Dare God get loose? You know, I I would love to say that um, that, that this never happens, but I've been uh, uh, in the church long enough that, you know, I've heard enough conversations where where people say things like, um, you know, if, if there isn't a choir up here and they're not in robes and, and the organ isn't blaring and we aren't singing six verses of, of, of uh, just as I am, then God is not here and we are not worshiping. I, on the other hand, I've had people say, you know what, people who worship and they just stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, all that traditional mumbo jumbo and all those robes and all that stuff, I don't see how those people see like, I mean, that's not worship. That's not worship. How could that be worship? I don't understand it. It's not my thing. Maybe some of you have said those very things. I don't know. I hope not. How insulting is it to God for us to think that we can put him in a box and that one service or one worship is the only way that you can get to God? And one voice, and one song, and one type of dress is the only way that you can get to God. It is the only way that God can show up. I mean, how insulting, how prideful of you and me to even think that. How good we are at cramming God in a box when it suits us. We can look at these Pharisees all day long and say, well, they just didn't understand and they just didn't know and they didn't realize all the power of God and and they they, they were just... But you and I do it too. You and I do it too. John, 8, John 9, 18. The Jewish leaders still refused to believe the man. So the blind man had been blind and could now see. So they called in his parents. So they called in his parents. And, and this part of the scripture, his parents, don't, they don't really do anything. I mean, basically they say, that's my son. And yes, he was blind. And then the, the Pharisees keep asking that same question over, well, what happened? Well, they weren't there, so they don't know. And they didn't want to say what everybody else was saying, because if they agreed, then they would get kicked out of their synagogue. They wouldn't be able to stay there and worship. And so they just kind of waffled a little bit. Yeah, that's our boy. And yeah, he's been blind, but we don't know how it happened. I mean, we don't, we, we, we are, we have no idea what happened there. And you get this sense that the parents are probably going, look, dude, (laughs) the boy is 20-some years old. He's been living at home all this time. He can go out and get him a job, which means he can move out of my house and get off my payroll, and I can make his room into a man cave, so it is all good, right? Yeah. John 9, 24 says, for the second time they called in the man who had been blind and told him God should get the glory for this because we know this man, Jesus, is a sinner. Don't give Jesus any credit. Don't give him any credit. He's obviously a sinner. He doesn't fit in our box. He's obviously not God. And this blind guy I love this. This is my favorite. It's on the front of your bulletin if you pick the bulletin up. I love this text. He says, I don't know. I don't know whether he is a sinner or not. He replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I can see. I don't know if he's from God or not. I don't know if it's the right day or the wrong day to heal somebody. I don't know. I don't really care. I can see. I can see. Look, I'm just a beggar. And there are many things that I don't understand. But I do know this. 30 minutes ago, I couldn't see and hadn't seen for 20 plus years. But right now I can. I've had folks over the years ask me if I ever doubt. 
It's, I think it's a common question. I think it's something we ask one another. Do you ever doubt? Do you, do you ever doubt? And of course I do. My answer is always the same. Of course I do, because I have questions about things that I don't understand. But I know that there are things in this life that are undeniable. What's undeniable? Well, it's pretty undeniable to me that you and I exist. You and I exist. And somehow, maybe if I had stayed in physics class a little longer, I would have figured out how. But the sun and the moon and the, oh, everything's swinging around and the earth's rotating around the sun. And there's light and there's dark and there's rain and there's vegetation and there's animals and there are people and there's kissing and then babies. And then that whole thing happens, right? And here you are. And it's undeniable. Now, you got two options the way I see it. You can either believe, one, that there is a great creator in this world that is bigger than this world, that created everything. Or option two is that everything came from nothing. Now, I don't know, a few minutes ago, we sang a song called 100 Billion Times, and it, it preached that right there for you. You sang it. I hope you believe it. I hope you believe it. That God, because that to me is undeniable, that God paints every morning. That that he created those crazy little bees I don't understand. That he did all of that and that that is part of his creation. That to me is undeniable. It is undeniable to me that a Jewish carpenter lived and that he taught and that he went to the cross and was crucified. I can look that up in a history book and find that somewhere. If, If I need to believe that much. But I also believe that he was the son of God and that once he was on that cross, he went to the ground and was buried. And three days later, he came out and God was glorified. And I believe that. And that is undeniable to me. Why? Because there were 12 men that at least that saw him. And 11 of them gave their lives for him. Horrible deaths for him. So that that voice and that the Christian gospel would would ring out and you're here today because of that you know it's undeniable that Jesus Christ changed me it's undeniable if you looked at my life from beginning to end and you looked at the string of setbacks you'd say well that girl ain't never gonna be no preacher (laughs) setback 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 set up you don't have to understand or you don't even have to explain God I don't care who you are you don't even have to believe in him but you cannot deny you cannot deny what he's done in your life I cannot deny that for me I don't know but now I see the Pharisees kicked the man out after that verse 35 says when Jesus heard what had happened he found the man and he asked do you believe in the son of man and the man answered who is he sir I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshiped Jesus. You don't have to understand everything to believe something. As I close this morning, um, there are a lot of things I just don't understand. Uh, This week especially. See, see, I don't understand why my friend is gone at the age of 52. I don't know who that makes sense to, but it doesn't make sense to me. I, I don't understand why those three kids are without a dad this morning. I, I don't understand why my friend's precious wife will celebrate alone their 30th wedding anniversary this May. I don't understand. I don't understand why a man who ate the right food and exercised and did all the right things died Wednesday full of cancer. It makes no sense. I know what that man would say though. He'd say, ah, George Ann, that's just set up. That's just God setting up. That ain't no setback. It looks like a setback, but it's not. It's a setup. It's undeniable that Tony's life changed because of Jesus Christ, because he stood right here and he told y'all that. He witnessed that to you. 
It is undeniable that Tony offered his life for the kingdom of God because he lived it for 30 years. It is undeniable that he and his family lived out their faith and trusted in God in the last 10 months in ways that I never thought were possible. I don't understand. I don't get it. But Jesus said this, this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. And Tony Putnam told me that. Quoted that verse right there to me. Not six weeks ago. There's something bigger here. It's bigger than Tony. It's bigger than his family. And it's bigger than your unbelief. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father God, every day we wake up and we make a choice to trust you in all things. We do. We, we make a choice to trust you in the good times. And, and God, we can confidently and boldly say we trust you when things are going good. But God, when times get hard and things are bad, it's difficult to understand your ways and we don't understand. So today, God, we need you. We, we need you because we got some unbelief. We've got some, some, some not understanding here and because we can't see all that you see and we need to see the way you see, God. So God, today we trust you and we believe that you see things as they really are and not the way that we see them. We need to, you to help us today with our unbelief. God, I, I ask this, all of this, in the precious name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand and worship our undeniably faithful God.
May the God of love, the God of mercy, and may the God that never will fail us, may he be with you today and in the days ahead. Pray that you have a good week. God bless.